I call this meeting to order. This is the Finance and Government Operations Committee of the City Council. All kit committee members are present um, via Zoom today. Um, this is a remote or online meeting where all participants will be on a video or audio conference. Members of the public have the opportunity to address the committee if they have signed up for public comments per the rules as published on the agenda and on our website Friday. We will call for the speakers when we get to the individual agenda item you signed up for. Here are the public comment ground rules. Comments are to be addressed to the committee members only. Each participant has two minutes to present. Any disruptive conduct will result in the removal from the meeting. We will now move on to agenda item A, EC-223. And then EC-223, approving the downtowner development and disposition agreement for the housing projects in downtown and the railroad, railroad metropolitan development areas. Uh, move approval. Councilor, is there any questions or staff or staff or the administration? Is there a second? Councilor Bassan, second. Councilors, any questions or comment? Okay. Um, need a vote? Councilor Bassan. Yes. Councilor Davis? Yes. Councilor Fabelcoy? Yes. Councilor Pena? Yes. And Councilor Sanchez? Yes. That passes unanimously. Um, Mr. Chair, I believe that you all are muted. Is that better? Okay. We'll now move to agenda item B, 056. Councilor Bassan. Mr. Chair, 056 is um, there's a committee substitute amending the accountability and government oversight or I'm sorry, government ordinance, chapter two, article 10 of the revised ordinances of Albuquerque. I move it to pass. Okay, do I have a second from Councillor Feeblecorn? Uh, Mr. Chair, uh, I would like us to. I, I, let me move the committee, the next committee substitute first, but then I would like after we move that, if it's if it's all right with you to hear from Miss Kelly, the yes. auditor, so that she can give us an update. We haven't really heard from her yet um, regarding this ordinance, and I want her to have a chance to kind of describe the why we came to where we're at and how we got there. So okay, I would like to move the committee substitute in your iPads. Okay. Do I have a second? Is it still Councillor Feeblecorn? Thank you, Councillor. So, Mr. Chair, if it's okay with you, can we vote on the committee substitute and then go from there? Sure, we sure can. And Councillor Bassan? Yes. Councillor Davis? Yes. Councillor Feeblecorn? Yes. Councillor Pena? Yes. And Councillor Sanchez? Yes. Passes on a five zero vote. So, Mr. Chair, I would like to invite Ms. Kelly to go ahead and give us a summary of the, the ordinance at this point, please. And I believe, Mr. Chair, that you are still muted. Thank you, Ms. Kelly. Go ahead. Thank you, Chair and uh, committee members. Um, so, where we are now, um, in my humble opinion, I think there's really only three substantive changes. Um, although it looks like the ordinance is pretty redlined, there is some cleanup and we're trying to um, align the language with uh, government auditing standards. Um, but really the, the, the primary changes are surrounding the budgetary structure. Um, currently, like all city departments, um, we participate in the city's budget process where we request funding. Um, each year, 
Um, we're proposing to restructure that and make our, our budget a function of the city's reoccurring general fund, subject to a 5% cap. Um, so we'll never increase or decrease more than 5% year over year. Um, along those lines, uh, the current ordinance provides our oversight committee, the AGO committee, the ability to review the inspector general and the city auditor's salary as part of the annual budget process. Um, since we're proposing to change that process, we have to also provide them a mechanism to review those salaries. So we're not proposing um, a specific salary. That is the discretion of the AGO committee members. All we're simply doing is proposing um, that they retain the ability to review our, our salaries. And if they elect to change them, that they have a mechanism to do that through the dedicated funding model. Um, and then lastly is the ability to retain outside camp counsel, which the ordinance currently provides for. Um, and actually the budget was uh, funded. We were, we were granted funding to retain outside counsel uh, this, this budget cycle. Uh, so we're just asking to be to retain that ability um, and that we would still notify city attorney's office, but we wouldn't require their approval if we felt there was a, a conflict of interest. Um, and so those are the primary changes. Currently, the ordinance works well for us. It's it's really, again, in my opinion, minimal changes um, to align A with government standards, um, with with internal auditing, best practices, and then to kind of make sure that we are in a position to, to grow small at a small pace when the city's risk grows as well. Um, so those are our proposed changes. Thank you, Ms. Kelly. Councilor Bassan. Uh, Mr. Chair, I do have one amendment that uh, Ms. Kelly had requested us make sure that we try to try to get into here. And then if we want to ask questions and discuss this further, mm -hmm. I would be happy to do so. But I would like to move amendment one on page two, line six, amend as follows. Whereas the accountability and government oversight committee should have the ability to ensure salaries for the city auditor and inspector general are maintained at a level commiserate with their responsibilities and then strike the rest. And then on page nine, line 11, um, add in after um, city personnel rules and reg regulations, add in the committee shall provide written justification for any salary adjustment to include any salary information considered or salary analysis conducted. The city auditor and inspector general shall be provided with compensation commiserate with their responsibilities and then strike the rest. Experience performing certific certifications, advanced degrees, and salaries of other comparable city auditors and inspectors general may be considered in determining compensation. And so this is clarifying a bit more about what, what we've been discussing um, a little bit regarding the salaries and making sure that it's not being compared to individual department heads uh, because the offices have been different. They are, they are different and independent versus a full department. So this is making sure that there are some checks and balances while the AGO committee were to go ahead and move forward with ever changing up or suggesting any kind of salary uh, adjustment for either the auditor or the inspector general. Thank you, Councillor Basson. Councillors, any questions or comments? I need a second. And okay, Councillor Philip Thorne, I see a razor. Raise, raise your hand on video. And um, counselors, any other questions or comments? Being none, we'll go to the vote on the amendment. Councilor Bassan. Yes. Councilor Davis. Yes. Councilor Fiebelkorn. Yes. Councilor Pena. Yes. Councilor Sanchez. Yes. And that passes on a 5 0 vote. Okay, counselors, any other questions or comments? Um, otherwise, we're going to move to the final bill. I'd Session. actually, I see okay. that. Oh, I'm sorry. Apologize. Go ahead, Councilor Pena. I think Councilor Davis was before me. Okay. No, ma'am, go ahead. I just seen the admin come on, so I just was wondering if they had any questions or comments before we move forward. Mayor's conference room, any comments? Mr. Chair, I think 
Uh, I'm a little late on this, but I think uh, the previous uh, change to uh, previous amendment that uh, there has to be a study accompanied by uh, the recommendation with the recommendation uh, that they have compared the salaries with uh, other city IGs and internal auditors. Uh, that's a good uh, amendment. However, I would I would add that that study should be done independently and not by IG or internal auditor. That's that's what I would recommend. Okay, thank you. Councillor Davis, is you're up. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, uh, and I appreciate this. I just wanted to ask the sponsor and maybe the administration. Uh, Ms. Kelly, it was great to, to visit with you last week and uh, Ms. Sansa Savon as well. Um, about this ordinance, and I'm, I appreciate all the work that's gone into it. I think, um, Mr. Chair, and maybe the sponsor, I think my question is, is more broad. I know a lot of work has gone into this, but I think some of those conversations have, uh, have encouraged us to look at other cities just to be sure that we're aligning with sort of current practices, and every city's kind of all over the place. That I, I think this, to be to its credit, has a lot of, of assets and valuable pieces that improve our ordinance. And I appreciate that, particularly the independence piece, um, satisfying some of the concerns around budget, I think is a, uh, a baseline budget, I think is absolutely critical. Um, and so I, I applaud you all on working that. I think my question is, you know, I, I seem to recall that years ago, we split this department or this, this agency, I guess, the quasi independent agency, um, Kind of from a single agency with an auditor and an, an inspector general into these two sort of uh, different co-equal branches, and I just wonder if it's time for us to to revisit maybe consolidating all this so that you know under the internal auditor, for example, like in other cities. I realize the IG has extra duties, but I wonder if the committee evaluated that option, um, and and if and if so, why they chose to to remain this way instead of the other, because I think they're kind of other cities have split each way. Thank you, Councillor Davis. Well, Mr. Chair, I think that was a question either for the sponsor or maybe the administration. I'm not sure. I, I'm just curious why they, if they evaluated that option and if they could tell us a little more um, about why they chose to, to keep them sort of quasi independent instead of merging them into one office so they could, because uh, they are kind of de facto the same office for us now in the city. Councilor Bassan. Uh, Mr. Chair, Councilor Davis, I would defer to Ms. Kelly um, and then later to Ms. Santi Stavon if, I mean, I'm open to discussion about it. That was something that happened admittedly before I was a counselor and before I was really paying this close attention to the happenings in the IA offices and the IG offices. So um, I don't want to speak to reasoning as to, but I know I haven't heard of it aside from conversations earlier today uh, about whether or not it should be considered to merge them back together. So I don't know if that's the will of the, the committee or if it's something that they discussed. Thank you, Ms. Kelly. Yes, Mr. Chair. So that that actually was not part of this exercise. Um, Melissa and I were both and AGO was res, um, deliberately respecting the will of council and their um, separation of both offices. Um, I think I can speak for both Melissa and I that, you know, we feel that the offices are are working under under that current structure. Um, we are definitely open to the perspectives of, of possibly the administration if they feel otherwise. Uh, but that was not that was not the intent of, of these bills is to restructure them. Um, it was really just to provide a bit more um, structural independence so that we could operate under the existing um, um, structure the, the the split between both offices. Mr. Chair, uh, thank you, Ms. Kelly, and, and to the sponsor. Mr. Chair, would it be possible to ask the administration, I know they've been doing some research um, and looking at some other cities, and, and again, I want to say the, the point is not to sideline uh, this bill or to sidetrack the process, um, but I just want to be sure, like, it, to lay a foundation before I turn it over to the administration. I think we've had four or five auditors and inspectors general since I've been here. And I think we've changed this office back and forth at least three major times. Um, and I agree with Ms. Kelly. It, it, it's producing work. It's doing a good job. Um, and uh, it's doing it's meeting its audit plan um, and investigations. But I just 
I feel like we change this all the time and we do all these little these tinkerings and we've been looking for an opportunity to really do a, a wholesale evaluation of this structure uh, for a while. So, Mr. Chair, if it's okay, could the administration weigh in? Yes, Mayor's Conference Room. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you, Councilor Davis. I think uh, <clears throat> I agree. Uh, we, we have an opportunity here to look into this in a, uh, from a wholesale per perspective. The administration would be amenable uh, to, to have that conversation with the council, with AGO. I believe that in past, when they were uh, one office, it had worked. Uh, in past, when there were two separate offices, that has worked as well. But there are benefits to probably making them one office. Uh, and that way, there could be higher level of synergy between the two. And there is no confusion uh, which complaint goes to IG, which complaint goes to internal auditor, because the people who call, they call uh, randomly to any of those two. Or in their mind, they think they are calling the right office. However, if there is one person above both of those offices, I think there may be a better way of evaluating how to use the resources in those, those both offices. And it certainly makes sense, in my opinion, to at least have that conversation. And we would be open to that. Mr. Chair, if I could follow, I know we have another member of AGO in our committee here at FGO, so I certainly want to defer to the Council People Corner if she cares uh, or wants to weigh in on this conversation. My suggestion might be, uh, and again, I know this is by request, but the, the AGO members on the committee are here and they have a lot of ownership in this process. I think we've done a great job of fixing the independence questions that existed and that would carry forward in any bill going forward, but I don't know that it's as urgent that we pass this today. Um, I think we know of uh, anticipating some some potential other changes uh, over the next few months in these offices that that might need to be considered as well. And so I might recommend that we defer this at least just for 30 more days just to evaluate um, the proper structure with these incorporated uh, pieces. But I would defer, I think, to the sponsors who are the, the AGO members um, if they would be open to that. Uh, or in the alternative, if we move this forward to council, I would like to do it with no recs so that we'd have time just to confirm that we've evaluated those options and, and evaluated any other potential changes that might happen in the interim. Councilor Feeblecorn, did you want to chime in? Uh, sure, Mr. Chair. I, I am actually not a member of the AGO, so uh, I've been taking um, Councilor Bassan's lead on this, and so I will I will go along with the will of the committee on this one. My uh, Mr. Chair, I, I see that Councilor Pena had something before me, but if it, oh, if it, it. I just am not clear if we're making a motion for deferral or changing it to no rec. Um, I would either, either, Mr. Chair, but I'm, if depending on Councilor Pena. Okay, let's hear Councilor Pena out. Councilor Pena. Um, I'm not on AGO either, <laughs> so I'm kind of just relying on, on uh, Councillor Bassan, but I do agree with Councillor Davis, and I think that you know, maybe a little bit more time to kind of digest, digest um, what the um, mayor's conference room just had to say from the administration, and then plus, um, you know, the independent study, I mean, that's a really good point. I know we're going through some stuff with council now where we're having to fill out some stuff, and it's really a whole independent committee from us in relation to, you know, what counselors or whatever should be paid. So that's something that we should consider. I would want to make sure that we do it right. Just like Councillor Davis said, you know, we have had um, several, um, several people since I've been here um, in and out. And so um, I feel like I'm good with it the way it is, but I think 30 days would give us an opportunity to really um, be able to kind of just make sure we do it right once and for all. But um, if not, I would support the um, no rec. Okay, my, Mr. Chair, I'm so sorry. My okay, I think that from what I gathered, my internet froze right as Councilor Davis was telling me if it was no rec or deferral. And so I think from what I gathered when it came back on that it was a preference of deferral. Is that okay? So there's a motion for deferral. I'm I mean, I'm happy to let us vote if we need to or or however. I know that there's been a lot of work going into this, but I also respect that 
I mean, I would like to see it move somewhere, but I also understand that the concerns seem that they're valid and strong enough that I will defer to the committee. Okay. Mr. Chair, we, yes, I'm sorry, we don't have a motion, but if it, so okay, I, I think I'll make one just okay. to defer it for the next meeting of FGO. And as always, um, if we can resolve these questions with the administration and we all agree that the, the proposed structure should remain in the interim, we can always pull it out of committee to full council in the meantime. Um, but I would make a motion for a 30 day deferral um, sort of sidebar condition on if Mr. Bakta would lend us a staffer or someone to assist with that independent evaluation very quickly so we can get an answer before FGO and make a decision and get this done before uh, we get into budget season since this is going to be a, a budget question now that we have some budget implications. All righty, thank you. Well, just for my two cents is I actually agree as well. I think the deferral would, would service time and I think uh, Miss Kelly under, um, was was understanding everything as well, so I feel pretty confident that that uh, if we do that, we'll be in in we'll be okay. So um, I just need a second for the vote on deferral. Um, Councilor Pena is a second, and we'll go to a vote for deferral. Councilor Bassan, pass. Councilor Davis. Yes. Councillor Peeblecorn? Yes. Councillor Pena? Yes. Councillor Sanchez? Yes. Passes on a 4 0 vote. Uh, Ms. Montoya? Yes. Uh, with a pass, I believe you circle back at the end. So I just want to go ahead and say that I would go ahead and be a yes at this point. Okay. Thank you. 5 0. Councillor Sanchez, I think you're. We will, we will move on to agenda item C055. Uh, Councillor Bassan, by re request. Mr. Chair, thank you. I'm pulling it up, and my apologies. If I go away, it's because my internet is somehow unstable. Okay. Let me get back on track. Okay, here we are. Thank you, Mr. Chair. 055 is amending the City Inspector General Ordinance Chapter 2, Article 17 of the Revised Ordinances of Albuquerque. I move a due pass. And do we have a second? Councillor Feeblecourt. Mr. Chair, Ms. Santi Stevan is here to speak, um, but I don't know if if you want to hear from her first, or I mean, Yes. We've been down this road before, so I kind now of see writing on the wall, but at the same time, I will defer to you whether you want to do questions from counselors or hear from Ms. Santi Stevan first. Let's hear questions from counselors, and then we'll go straight to Ms. Santi Stevan. Anything from counselors? Not seeing any hands up. So, Ms. Santi Stevan, the floor is yours. Thank you, Chairman and council members. Um, I just wanted to kind of reiterate what Ms. Kelly said. These ordinances were um, very similar in nature and the changes were made to align the two ordinances because they were not. Um, and so any changes that, um, or I would say at least the primary changes made in the uh, AGO ordinance is are the same changes that are being made in the IG's ordinance. So I don't think there's anything more to, for me to add unless you have specific questions. I don't have any specific questions and I think I'm going to hear something similar from the mayor's conference room. Uh, so since they're similar, are we going to end up deferring this one as well? Anybody want to chime in? Um, Mr. Chair, the mayor's conference room has their hand up. If, if you guys can, because it's hard for us to see you. Yeah, I at, can't see it. Oh, I see it now. Yeah. Mayor's thank conference you. room. Mr. Chair, thank you. Uh, uh, because the previous or uh, previous bill was deferred, I think both of these bills kind of go hand in hand. And if, if the council, the AGO, and administration is going to have a conversation about possibly combining these two offices, it would be premature to to actually uh, you know vote on this uh, bill. I, I believe 
I would recommend that uh, uh, you consider deferring this as well, uh, so that you know whatever we want to do in a wholesale manner <clears throat> would have time, and we don't have to kind of reverse something which that you you agree on today and may regret. Uh, that's that's my that's my uh, request. Thank you. Okay, Councillor Basan. Any other councillors would like to chime in, Councillor Davids? Uh, just a motion for deferral till our next meeting of the FGO. Okay. Uh, we've got a se second from Councillor Feeblecorn. So we're going to vote on deferral to the next meeting. And we're... thank you, Ms. Montoya. Councillor Basan? Pass. Councillor Davis? Yes. Councillor Feeblecorn? Yes. Councillor Pena? Yes. Councillor Sanchez? Yes. Councillor Basan? Yes. That passes on a 5 0 vote. We'll now move on to agenda item D 059. Councillor Feeblecorn. Thank you, Mr. Chair. This is 059, adopting a new article in Chapter 13 of the Revised Ordinance of Albuquerque 1994, Business and Occupations, to be known as the Residential Rental Permit Ordinance, establishing a permitting requirement and permitting fee. Um, we are still taking input from the public on this. Uh, we had a series of meetings, and I would like to move a deferral um, actually to the April 10th meeting of FGO for this bill. Thank you. Do I have a second from Councillor Davis? So we'll go to a vote for deferral. Councillor Passan? Mr. Chair, I'm sorry. Uh, there's a, I think there's some several people signed up to speak on this bill. Oh, Before this we vote and close it out, can I request that we hear from them, please? Yes. Thank you. Sorry about that. And Mr. Chair, if I can just say, I, I know folks are signed up and I definitely want to hear them. I just want to reiterate that we, we've had a series of meetings. We are working on revisions to this. Um, if anybody has any you know, input, I'm happy to take it tonight or in any other format because we will be coming back with something you know new um, in April. Thank you. And I just wanted to apologize to the public for uh, for missing that. So, uh, Mr. Garrett, if we can go to pub, the folks that are ready to sign up to speak. Thank you. Mr. Chair, I'm going to our first speaker signed up to speak is Denise Long, followed by Tim Nisley. Hi, good evening, um, counselors. I am a licensed real estate broker practicing property management in Albuquerque for over 25 years. And I just want to give you some feedback from the trenches. Um, O2259 seems to me like a lot of admi administrative overload for the city of Albuquerque, also maintenance of some serious secure data in requiring that we give to the city of Albuquerque all of the leases and the private information of all tenants. My other concern is that it'll just pass down costs to the tenants. We are in a fight right now to keep rents down for tenants and make affordable housing, and this will do exactly the opposite. And that's it for your consideration. Our next speaker is Tim Nisley, followed by Fritz Eberly. Tim Nisley, followed by Fritz Eberly. Fritz Eberly, followed by Diego Lopez. Yes, can you hear me? We can hear you. Okay, I, I actually, I, I'm, I pretty much want to echo um, what the last speaker said. I, I feel like the um, administrative costs, I'm also a property owner here, and the administrative costs, especially for small operators, I'm thinking about all those documents that will need to be uh, um, prepared. It, it seems clear that that's all going to have to be passed on to the tenants. And so if we're trying to really help tenants, that seems to me the opposite direction. So 
Um, and, and I feel kind of the same way about the, the next proposition. I have to go to a meeting, but uh, number 60 is coming up and, and it's essentially the same thing. So thank you very much for allowing me my input. Our next speaker is Diego Lopez, followed by Craig Berman. Thank you. Uh, my name is Diego Lopez, and I have a few long-term rental properties and quite a few short-term rental properties. And the city, I just got out of a meeting um, put together by the mayor's office, and they're trying to vastly limit my ability to rent my properties short term. Um, I agree the city needs to have regulations for both short term and long term um, uh, people that are renting properties. But, you know, we have a lot of vacant uh, housing stock in the city. And I think this could be a very short process to get these units, you know, four months, six months, get them back on the market. And if these out of town owners don't want to do it, let me have a chance to do it. Let a lot of us have a chance to do it. And this weekend I was uh, going around with a realtor and he was showing me all the bank owned houses in this town. There are thousands and thousands and thousands of homes sitting in the bank portfolios, and they haven't been occupied in decades. I looked at wonderful homes in the sawmill district that are old adobe historic homes, and the roofs are caving in, and it's a bank. And I even put a bid on one. I, I would love to have one of them. And they would make wonderful 1,000 square foot rentals. And, uh, you know, I just, there's a lot of us. Thank you. Our next speaker is Craig Boney, followed by Tim. Can you hear me? We can hear you. Great. Uh, Committee members, thank you for uh, taking my uh, taking the time to, to listen to my comments. Uh, I, I'm a resident of District 9 with rental property in District 6. And as most of you know, uh, though most of the properties in that area are affordable housing. Um, and uh, typically needing uh, to be updated uh, to, to get them, you know, nice and and everything and, and certainly my property is no different i've been working on that uh over the last few years at least um and of course with uh, prices continuing to go up it's kind of hard to to keep up with all that but uh you know and if there's um you know uh issues with uh you know the, the tenants might have uh then i'm certainly addressing that as as quickly as possible um I would say that this bill, uh, I request respectfully request that you vote against it. Um, the um, it, it basically require every unit to be um, uh, uh, get a permit, and uh, of course all those costs are going to uh, be added on to what tenants are having to pay. Um, I mean, all that stuff gets passed down and I'm, I'm trying to remain, you know, maintain affordable housing. Uh, and uh, so again, uh, the bookkeeping nightmare would probably require me to hire uh, additional support staff, uh, which again, you know, that all that has to get passed on somewhere. So, um, so I, I, I respectfully request that you vote against this, uh, uh, Bill and um, I. I appreciate the opportunity to uh, to give you uh, my comments. Thank you, Tim House, followed by Steve Grant. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. And Mr. Chair and Councilors. Uh, the, I I would I would like to speak against uh, twenty two fifty nine as well. 
the, uh, the, the facts are, as proposed by this bill, the fees will in, increase the cost of residential rental units, which will very most likely be passed through to the residents. It will also act as the deterrent to the lessors and landlords to remain in the residential rental business or to increase their rental units. Uh, in addition, the proposed penalties are extremely punitive and will further discourage investment into new rental units, which we are trying to remedy, uh, as we're all trying to remedy that together. So uh, I did get the, uh, the I, I did hear that uh, Councilor Fubelcorn wants, is gonna, wants to defer this till April 10th, and we will um, try to keep involved with the process. Thank you very much. Steve Grant, followed by Jim April? Nisley. Steve Grant, followed by Tim Nisley. Oh, there we go. I was on mute. Can you hear me now? We can hear you. Okay. So, sorry about that. I saw the deferral perspective and uh, thought that we weren't going to be discussing this, but I'll, I'll share my comments about um, uh, 2259. Uh, good evening, Mr. Chair and Councilors of the Committee. My name is Steve Grant. I'm a small property owner here in Albuquerque for over the last 20 years. I'm also the current president of the Apartment Association, representing thousands of owners throughout our great state. Uh, both our members and affiliates are seriously concerned about several items within the soonly proposed ordinance. And for that reason, we're uh, adamantly against these proposed concepts um, that will fully oppose uh, that are newly, uh, the, this particular ordinance. Um, the uh, permits and additional dwelling requirements, regardless of the size of your property, uh, there's a proposed fee from what I understand that's going to be anywhere from 70 to $700 um, I know it, it's based on the size and I get that, um, as well as a laundry list of specifics needed to be known by the city, statement of condition of the property, a list of fees, uh, compliance, et cetera. And so uh, all I'd like to ask is that, uh, why do we think these permits are suddenly warranted? And uh, is this really gonna help our overall housing challenge that we have in the marketplace? Uh, these are questions that we need to all ask ourselves. And, uh, you know, who's determined these fees and, and where is the money going to be going to? And there's, there's a laundry list of questions that we need to be thinking about. Um, we need to be, you know, looking at what we can do as a city to, um, to find solutions to our housing dilemma and not uh, find more red tape. So more to come. I'll be speaking again on uh, 2260. Thank you very much for, for your time. And I ask for you to consider a no vote on this when it comes time to do that. Thank you. Thank you. To the... We're trying to find one more. Uh, Steve, uh, excuse me, Tim Nisley. We tried to go back because we missed one and we wanted to make sure that we had, that we gave everyone a chance to speak. So um, now all I need is a second. And we do. Oh, okay. I got muted by a different source. Sorry. <laughs> so, uh, okay. So I had a second by Councillor Davis, and we're going to vote on the deferral. Councillor Basson? Yes. Councillor Davis? Yes. Councillor Fubelcorn? Yes. Councillor Pena? Yes. Pena? Yes. Thank you. Councilor Sanchez? Yes. And and passes on a 5 0 vote. And Mr. Chair, you keep getting muted. I think something's going on with the, with the system here because um, we're passing the, the uh, keyboard and the mouse between all three of us. So sorry about that. 
So that passes and it looks like the deferral is moving to April 10th. Is that correct? Okay, now we will move on to agenda E O sixty. <clears throat> Councillor Feeblehorn. Thank you, Mr. Chair. This is um O59. Oh, I'm sorry, O60, <laughs> adopting a new article in chapter 11 of the revised ordinances of Albuquerque 1994 to be known as the residential tenant protection ordinance. Um, and move a due pass. One second. Councillor Davis, second. And Mr. Chair, I, I do have a committee substitute that I've been working on with the um, folks from the community for a while now. I want to make sure that we get that passed before conversation, if possible, so that everybody knows we're working off that new version of the bill. Okay. Can so I go ahead and move that now? Yeah, we're going to move the committee substitute. And do I have a second? Councillor Pena? And ready for the vote. Okay. Yeah, we're just bouncing everything around over here, so sorry about that. Councillor Bassan. Yes. Councillor Davis. Yes. Councillor Fievelcorn. Yes. Councillor Pena. Yes. And Councillor Sanchez. Yes. So now we're on the committee. So. And that passes on a 5 0 vote. Okay, I keep getting muted when they pass the, the uh, keyboard back and forth. So apologize for the, for the hiccups here. But uh, we're back on committee sub Councillor Feeblecorn. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So um, we've had a series of meetings with um, folks from the community. Um, property managers, property owners, um, housing advocates, low-income advocates. Um, we've worked with them over the last several months to develop the committee sub that's in front of us today. And um, it's very different from the original proposal. We, we tried to incorporate comments and feedback from all interested parties. So what's before you today is the committee sub. It does basically four things. One is it requires early disclosure um, of costs before someone enters into a lease. We feel like it should be really well known what those costs are going to be, what kinds of um, fees are going to be charged. So that's just requiring that that be noticed to people before they sign the lease. Um, it does set a limit of $150 for pre-lease signing fees. Um, and that was based on numbers that we got from the various landlords and property managers that we met with. It also sets forward um, some requirements for having uh, payments be taken, um, you know, allowing for all kinds of payments, but requiring money orders be accepted, um, because that is the one method that everyone could agree on was um, something that was accessible to them. We took out the requirements for things like cash and checks because we heard from landlords very, very um, clear examples of why that would not be um, a good thing to require. And then lastly, it does say that landlords are able to require renter's insurance, but they're not able to require folks to insure their own belongings, only have insurance to cover the property in case there is damage to that. All other provisions within the original bill have been dropped. And so those four things are what you have before you tonight. Um, and the reason for this Bill, again, is that we've heard a lot of folks from the community that were being charged really high fees that really dramatically impacted their ability to find and maintain affordable housing. And so I, I feel like what you have before you tonight is something that um, all the landlords and all the advocates that we've been meeting with over the last two to three months have, have agreed on in principle. And so with that, I will open up for questions. Counselors, any questions or comments? And is there anyone signed up to speak? Yes, Mr. Chair. Our first speaker today is Ashley McDavid Itak, followed by Denise Long. Uh, hi, I don't know if you can hear me. 
can hear you. Okay. Um, I want to thank Tammy for reaching out. I reached out to her when I heard this bill or this ordinance was being drafted. I think this is a good ordinance. She worked very hard. She was willing to listen to a property manager. I'm a property manager, have been for over four years and own my own personal properties. Um, it's a solid bill. It protects both not just the tenant, but also the property managers. It's, it's all about disclosure and keeping the renter's insurance was a main thing for us that there has to be a liability. We had two issues last year where we had to call on renter's insurance, which helped the tenants that they weren't bearing the cost of the damage to the properties that they had created. So I definitely would support and ask you guys to support this ordinance. Thank you. Denise Long, followed by Janice. Hi, again, um, I'm Denise Long. I'm a licensed real estate broker and realtor in Albuquerque, practicing real estate and property management for over 25 years. So it sounds like there have been some changes um, as to what was originally on here. And my main concern was the um, inability to require insurance, not just renter's insurance, but we require many of our tenants to have liability insurance especially when they're having pets. We've had a lot of dog bites that have resulted in property owners being sued. It's an easy lawsuit. Um, the other, other issues that I'm worried about, and it sounds like they've been dropped, is some of the um, imposition of accepting cash and personal check for rents. That's a security issue and too difficult. Also, um, I had a question about whether or not the pet segment, number F, saying that you have to allow pets without any additional rents. That would cause many property owners not to accept any pets at all and hurt the pet population. So those were my concerns. Um, thank you for your time. And if those issues have been dropped, then I would support the bill. Janice Herrera, followed by Tim Nisley. Good evening. Um, I thank the members of city council for listening to my story. Uh, I just wanted to share uh, what happened to me with my rental situation and why I'm in support for this ordinance. Uh, during the COVID pandemic, uh, I fell ill with COVID and was contacted by my landlord that they were raising the rent by several hundred dollars amounting to more than 25% of my monthly rent. And so I had to, even though I was sick with COVID, um, look online for a rental unit to move into uh, within the months. And um, during the pandemic, as you know, the availability of units was short. And so I was putting applications at places that were going to be reasonable for me um, to afford and to commute to work and had the unfortunate experience of having a landlord take my rental application. And then when I called to follow up, tell me, oh, is that unit still available online? That's funny, because we already filled it. Uh, and I was unable to get my money back for the rental application. Um, and I was applying all of these different places with no recourse, um, with no accountability as to how the landlords were actually using these quote unquote application fees that weren't actually going anywhere. Uh, and so I just wanted to, to speak to my experience. Um, and then also in my last few seconds, uh, wanted to just advocate for um, the uh, moratorium on um, rent limits, which would have helped my situation. I understand that's not currently under consideration, but when I visited the roundhouse, folks in the roundhouse were looking to you all as a bellwether and saying, if we couldn't get anything passed in Albuquerque, why should we do anything on a state level? Uh, and so it's just this catch 22 that I wanted to mention. Thank you for your time. Tim Nisley, followed by Fritz Eagerly. Thank you, counselors. I appreciate the time. Um, I just want to say this is um, 
I have not seen the amended version of this until now, but um, I appreciate the amendments that were done. Um, thank you all for listening to the feedback you received. Um, as this is, uh, it is something that um, we can't, I believe I can support. Um, it's interesting to think about the, um, the written disclosures for an applicant, um, minimum credit scores and things like that. Often when you get applicants, you get 10 or 15 applicants, and then you sort through the mix of applicants. Um, you can't take them all, you can only take one. And so a minimum is a, it's a bit of a fluid, a difficult thing to regulate, I think, um, because you never know what, how many applicants are gonna get or what that looks like. But um, I'm glad you guys are moving us forward and support in general, um, support this will. Thank you. Fritz Eberly followed by Wolf Baumgartner. Wolf Baumgartner, followed by Craig Boney. Good evening, and thank you for allowing me to comment. Um, all New Mexicans should have access to affordable housing. Oh, I should begin. My name is Wolf Baumgartner from the New Mexico Center on Law and Poverty. And we want to point out that all New Mexicans should have access to affordable housing. Enacting the Residential Tenant Protection Ordinance will help uh, all Burkanios. We have a housing crisis. Even before the pandemic, New Mexico had the highest increase of homelessness in the country since between 2018 and 2019, an increase of 27%. New Mexico also had the highest increase of chronic homelessness during the same period, an increase of 57.6%. The COVID-19 pandemic has caused extreme economic hardships <clears throat> and rents have been skyrocketing. Uh, in Albuquerque alone, uh, rents have gone up 28% during the pandemic. With record growing inflation, rising rent, stagnant wages, and more and more renters in Albuquerque um, are just finding increasing hardships um, and risks for becoming housing unstable and homeless. We must take swift action to protect the renting families in Albuquerque, um, and we support this bill. Thank you. Craig Bowden, followed by Alan Lasek. Good evening, counselors. Uh, uh, thank you for taking a moment to listen to my comments on this. I have not uh, seen the amended version of this bill, uh, but some of the things that have bothered me on this uh, were around uh, having to um, list everything by uh, that every, I every charge. I can put this on my earbuds until I go, love. I'm sorry. We apologize. Please continue. Oh, okay. Uh, so it's hard. It, it would be if somebody lives in a unit for four, five, ten years, it would be impossible to tell them on day one what it would cost to replace a refrigerator handle, for example, uh, if they were to break it or or some other number of things. <clears throat> um, especially with inflation having you know been what it was the last. A uh, couple of years. Um, the, um, the some of the other things in this uh, that are, were problematic for me was just the um, uh, fees and things that um, that that a person um, might get charged. I mean, obviously, if there there's probably not much change in you know if somebody bounces a check or something. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm not really all that concerned about that, but uh, when it comes to uh, pets, um, you know, the longer they're in a place, the worse things can get. I know I recently had a tenant move out that had been in the unit for almost 10 years and almost the entire time had uh, one or one and at least one, maybe two cats. And it took me a month to get the smell out uh, from, you know, from the urine and stuff that the cat had, had marked places and, and stuff like that. And I, I did finally get it out. And it just, it, it's, you know, it was way more than the $75 I charged her uh, to, to have that pet. Thank you. I, I requested you, honest, 
re respectfully request that you vote against this. Alan Lasek, followed by Catherine McGill. Chairman and committee members, my name is Alan Lasek, and I am the executive director of the Apartment Association of New Mexico. We represent about 38,000 rental units here in Albuquerque. Um, I do want to thank Camp Councillor Feeblecorn and uh, Abigail, I see on here as well, um, for sitting with us and working through on these versions of the bills. Uh, you know, unfortunately, this still is this bill is still very problematic for the rental industry, and I think it's going to have a lot of unintended consequences. And you know, I think it's well intended, but it's going to have a different outcome. Um, you know, in the definition section, we define landlord, uh, which is really obsolete and conflicts with the New Mexico Uniform Owner Resident Relations Act. The tenancy fees are confusing because of part of what it lists are actually rent, like parking fees and storage fees. The other part, like cleaning fees, actually fall under damages. Um, the idea of a tenancy fine is also problematic because private parties don't really charge fines. Also in here, a late fee would fall under a fine, um, where in the New Mexico Uniform Owner Resident Relations Act, it's defined as a late fee. So we're basically making up definitions that contradict state law. And then really when you get to the disclosure, um, you know, you're gonna have this laundry list of what ifs. And I'll give you an example. If you have two kids and are outside throwing a baseball and one breaks a window, they didn't mean to, they're good kids. They admit to it. The management company then hires a window repair company. They come to fix it. Um, that management company can no longer bill the resident unless it was under their list of fees in the disclosure. And you also can't put a dollar amount on the window. I don't know if it was the big window, the small window, the kitchen window. And this is just one of a million different situations. So owners have two options. They can either create this massive disclosure list with every what if you can think of, or they have to raise the rents on everyone to cover what they can't charge in these fees. And in fact, we surveyed our membership and used wording out of here, and 86% of them said they would raise rents if this bill was to pass. So I really appreciate uh, Councilor Feeblecorn and, and all their time spent, but uh, we do oppose this bill. Thank you. Catherine McGill, followed by Chuck Sheldon. My name is Catherine McGill, director of the New Mexico Black Leadership Council, located in District 6 in the heart of the International District. I'm here to support the residential tenant ordinance. As you know, the International District is the most diverse and populous with the most multifamily dwelling units in the city. We will be the most affected by this ordinance. I still believe in common sense, good governance that is of the people, by the people, and for the people, all of the people. As relates to deposits, fees, and fines, in any contractual relationship, all parties have the right to know what is expected up front. All parties need to know if certain conditions exist before entering a contractual relationship. And it's not a good idea to, you know, talk about all the what ifs because we know that we enter into contracts all the time and this is common sense. All parties understand that if for some reason one of the parties accepts payments from me for a service that is not provided, a prompt refund should be submit should be remitted. Again, common sense. In our mutually agreed upon contractual relationship, I also need to know what the rules of the game are. Are there extra expenses that I will incur? What are those expenses? How will they be uh, assessed? You guessed it again, common sense. And finally, I believe that when we pass this ordinance, we can do what we did when we we're talking about the bill. We can create a committee that uses cross-sector collaborative methods to implement these common sense, fair and balanced approaches. And when we do that, we all win. So on behalf of the New Mexico Black Leadership Council and the, and the clients we are advocating for today, please support common sense, good governance and move this legislation to the full council. Thank you very much. Councillor Davis. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I just wanted to, to acknowledge Ms. McGill and say welcome. It's good to see you again and congratulations on uh, securing your new facility in the International District uh, for all your operations. That's a big endorsement for all the work you've been doing for years and a, and a big plus for everybody you work with. Congratulations, ma'am. Thank you. We're happy to be in the International District. This is where people are. Thank you, Ms. McGill. Thank you, Councillor Davis. Okay, Garrett. Chuck Sheldon. Chuck Sheldon. Thank you. Thank you, Council. Can you hear me? We can hear you. Thank you. I want to thank uh, Council Figo Horn. We've visited about this uh, a great deal, and and Abigail, uh, you know, I sent an email to this in for the changes. 
however, we still need to make more changes. And I think that, you know, just a, a key point in renter's insurance, one of the things we we look at in whole liability and when you when you deal with insurance companies and liability, you can only recover insurance from one. So if it's a, a minor thing, you're going to use the insurance from the tenant. If it's major, you have to go to your own insurance. It won't cover the deficiency. But a key point and not requiring only liability is that in some of these areas and many in the international area, uh, you know, people end up with bed bugs, people bring in other kinds of pests, and you have to have them go to a hotel, stay there in order to clean up the property. One of the things that happens without that insurance, you don't have the ability to go rent a property. And it's not the landlord's responsibility to put you in a hotel. If you have a flood, you you'll need to be uh, outsourced. You know, we had those situations and we had to call the Red Cross in order to get help for the tenants. You know, and I think by having insurance that covers the individual, it's cheaper than pure liability insurance. As crazy as that might sound, you know, it's a dollar less a month. That's one area to consider. The next, it was already brought up about expenses to try to identify all costs. We need to be more open in order to show what those expenses will be. So I think that for those reasons, it's Thank not you. complete yet. Jennifer Merriman, followed by Riley Massey. Good evening, counselors. My name is Jennifer Merriman, and I'm an organizer for the People's Housing Project. I've spent hundreds of hours visiting complexes throughout the Albuquerque area. One of the major themes that people speak to me about is the excessive fees that they pay. Application fees are the first mentioned and felt as the most egregious. People are angry as they tell me there's zero accountability or transparency in the collection of these fees. They feel ripped off because they're forced to submit several applications around town, hoping that at least one application will go through. People talk about feeling scammed because their fees aren't refunded for their applications if their applications turn down or if the unit is awarded to another renter. One lady said it's the most expensive lottery ticket I've ever bought. Counselors, these fees are preventing people from securing housing and an end to them by voting yet and 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 an end to them by voting yes to 022 would mean better access to housing for people in Albuquerque. Thank you. Riley Massey, followed by Bets Hampton. Good evening. My name is Riley Massey, and I'm housing stability managing attorney at New Mexico Legal Aid. Um, and New Mexico Legal Aid, we urge you to pass this bill. Excessive application fees disproportionately impact the low-income clients who we serve at New Mexico Legal Aid, particularly those holding federally subsidized vouchers. Again and again, we hear from clients that they are unable to secure new housing because they can't afford the application fees. This is of particular importance to those with vouchers who have a time limit in which to use their voucher at a new unit. If from a typical SSI monthly income of around 800, a tenant applies at three different apartments with $200 application fees, they have effectively lost almost their entire monthly income, especially if none of those application fees are approved. If they have a voucher, not only have they lost almost an entire month's income, but they have also put their voucher at risk of expiration, meaning that they lose it and lose the opportunity for affordable housing because they will have to wait for another month's income to apply again. Limiting these and other fees, um, and making them refundable to tenants will go a long way towards helping the low-income clients who New Mexico Legal Aid serves find safe and affordable housing. I would also just like to note in response to comments by the Apartment Association of New Mexico that it's my legal analysis that this bill does not conflict with state law. Um, we urge you to pass this bill. Thank you. Bex Hampton, followed by Kuveni Scanlon. Hi, my name is Bex. I'm an organizer at the People's Housing Project. Um, I just want to start off by saying 
I have been fortunate to never have to pay more than $30 and sometimes $0 to move into an apartment. So I'm not really sure what landlords are spending um, $150 or more on application fees on. It just, it doesn't really make any sense to me. Um, so I feel like this bill is extremely generous to profiteering landlords, you know, allowing for them to get a maximum of $150 when all the landlords I've ever rented from haven't needed more than $30 to get a background check um, or an application process. Um, so while I have personally benefited from the fact that um, some landlords are not price gouging, others around me, like Jennifer has mentioned, um, are really suffering. One of our organizers, Anna Lee, um, during the middle of the the pandemic when she was trying to find a place spent nearly four hundred dollars on application fees which effectively gutted her savings and she um, applied to several different apartments but was only approved for one and then we see all the time on zillow craigslist and whatnot landlords are putting apartments um you know up as listings and it says like over 100 people have applied for this so if 100 people are applying um, and paying $50, I mean, the landlords are already making even more money than they can make in a month's rent. So just by charging these predatory application fees, um, landlords um, are turning a profit when, you know, um, it, at, at people's expense, at poor people's expense, when everyone is just trying to find a place to live so they can survive. So um, I really think actually more needs to be done to expand affordable housing, of course, but I think this bill is a good step in the right direction. Kuveni Scanlon, followed by Alicia Clark. Hi, my name is Kuveni Scanlon. I am a former social worker for the Albuquerque Healthcare for the Homeless. Um, I worked with the homeless population and I have been a renter my entire life. So I am from the actual trenches. Um, I know multitudes of renters who are on a fixed income, including my neighbors. And I personally know many people who have been made homeless due to the fees upon fees um, at the very beginning of the rental process that have been piled upon them by um, the landlords. And uh, I truly do not understand um, what kind of background check costs more than $150. I truly um, have not heard of a background check that costs um, more than $150. I know um, my former clients, many of them have had to stay homeless because they could not afford the application fees. And Albuquerque is a city that suffers from chronic homelessness. And I believe that all of us as Burkinians, it is our duty to uh, make sure that this homeless um, issue is not something that we feed into. And one of the biggest ways we can do it is by putting a cap on the uh, on the application fees. And when it comes to the issue of insurance, I am a licensed insurance producer and agent. And I would like to say these people are knowingly taking the risk because renters are not children, they are adults, they are knowingly taking the risk of not getting um, liability, sorry, not getting our uh, personal insurance. So they are knowingly taking the risk. And uh, um, I believe um, the landlords can agree on that. If they're getting liability for the building that they're in, that is all that they um, have to do because again, renters are not children. So um, I urge y'all to pass this ordinance um, and um, move, move it forward for the city. Thank you so much. Alicia Clark, followed by Tim House. Hi, my name is Alicia Clark. Um, I am a small landlord in Albuquerque. I own a duplex that I recently purchased uh, in Wells Park, and I have a casita um, behind my house. I I'm support in support of this bill. I'm also a lawyer with New Mexico Legal Aid, though I do not practice housing law at the moment. Um, really, I, I think this is a no-brainer, and I think if the counselors um, just uh, put themselves in um, the, the tenants' uh, um, shoes for just a moment and, and just realize, as um, Ms. McGill said, we all everyone has a right to know the terms uh, that they're agreeing to. This is basically all this bill is doing is requiring fees to be disclosed up front and putting a cap on the application fee, which is, as others have said, is very reasonable. Um, 
I, I don't see uh, why um, landlords should be allowed to take advantage of people who are clearly not negotiating um, on the same um, level as they are. These these folks who are applying for housing are desperate. And, um, you know, if we don't pass this bill, um, you know, we're endorsing essentially uh, this a really unfair, as someone else said, predatory practice by certain, not all landlords, but certain landlords. Um, and so I really, uh, I support this bill and I, that's all I want to say. Thank you. Tim House, followed by Steve Grant. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair and counselors. Uh, this, this bill, I, I agree completely that uh, that transparency is utmost and that the lessor landlord should make the application as transparent as possible and all disclosures possible at the at the time of application. Uh, that said, I do not believe that the city should get involved in establishing fees for the services in the private sector and should not and should let the market set those fees. Uh, the ordinance as drafted proposes to be enacted in order to assist lower income residents. Uh, I believe that it will be one further block to adding more housing units. Thank you very much. Steve Grant. Good evening, Mr. Chair and counselors, once again, of the committee. As I mentioned, I'm a small property owner here in Albuquerque. Over the last 20 years and current president of the apartment association representing thousands of owners and operators in our great state. <clears throat> like others, I want to thank uh, Councilor Fevercorn for opening up dialogue between both large and small property owners to work through this proposed ordinance at the very end of the year. However, with that said, both our members and thousands of independent owners making up about 80% of the rental market here in Albuquerque alone are still seriously concerned about several items with this proposed ordinance. For one, it's going to be an extreme um, legal challenge to simply prepare the full disclosure documentation required for a prospective tenant. The ordinance states that they must, I quote, must take, must make the following written disclosure statement to a potential applicant through and or other communication. Secondly, the background check fee is held by the owner until processed. If approved, all is good. However, if not approved, it's supposed to be refunded within 15 days. Additionally, all other fees must be disclosed, making it much more cumbersome for both the tenant and the property owner. Thirdly, under this ordinance, when a tenant pays their monthly rent, the owner and the management companies are required to provide a written receipt. And lastly, um, we can't even require that the tenant have renter's insurance, and Chuck Sheldon mentioned about the renter's insurance, putting more of the liability back on the property owner one more time. And for these reasons and more, we are still adamantly against the overall concept of this ordinance. We, of course, applaud the efforts to find a way to help the tenant become more protected. However, I believe that there's got to be a better way. And for that reason, I ask that you please consider a no vote on 2260. Thank you very much. That concludes general public comments. Councilors, any other questions or comments? Mr. Chair, I'd, I'd like to just respond to a few of the things that were asked during the public comment period, if you would mind. Yes, go ahead, Councilor. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So I, I did want to just go down the list of things I wrote down to just make sure we're all on the same page. Um, the committee sub that's out there tonight does allow um landlords to require insurance um, it does not allow them to require insurance for your own personal property but it but is allowed for them to have a requirement for insurance for their for the you know the property of the building um, that they're renting out so that i just want to make sure that's clear there is no longer any um, mention of acceptance of cash payments in this bill uh, we heard really good rational explanations from landlords of why they did not want to have a lot of cash around, and we took that out. There's also no reference in this bill to any kind of um, pet allowances or disallowances on payments for um, pet rent. Um, 
there um, is no requirement in this bill for a credit minimum to be established. All this bill says that if there is a credit minimum that you've established as a landlord, you have to tell people that up front. Um, so there's no requirement that anything be like um, be like be, anything like that be included. Um, and want to make sure that the discussion around fees, um, you know, the, the fees that are required to be disclosed in this bill are fees that are either part of the application process. And those are limited at $150. There is no limit on any other type of fees that are in, in allowed. Um, you just have to tell folks what those fees are going to be. So monthly fees throughout the lease term just have to be disclosed at the beginning of the um, lease. Um, just wanted to clarify that there is a process in here and, and all of the landlords that we spoke to um, agreed with this. They can take multiple application fees. However, if those if that application fee is not if the application is not processed, they do have to refund that money to the applicant if they've already found um, a person to rent the premises. And this is to get to the issues that we've heard from numerous people tonight about having to put up multiple application fees throughout the process. And then lastly, um, there is a requirement in here that if you take a payment for rent, you do have to provide some sort of receipt and that can be written or um, emailed and it doesn't have to be provided when rent is paid, but soon thereafter. And I think that is a reasonable request when someone is paying you a large amount of money that a receipt is required. Um, so I think that that uh, was all the ones that I wrote down as folks were going through, um, Mr. Chair. So I'll stand for any other questions. Thank you, counselors. Any other questions? Um, counselor Fever, oh, Counselor Pena. I was, um, thank you, Mr. Chair. I was just wondering if the admin had any comments and then I'd like to make some comments. Mayor's conference room, any comments? Uh, Mr. Chair, we are supporting this bill. Uh, other than that, I don't have any comments. Back to Councilor Pena. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Yeah, I mean, I just really want to thank Councilor Peeblecorn. I think she's done an outstanding job with this, you know, working with everyone. I know it's taken a lot of time. Um, tonight we passed, um, we passed the or introduce the floor sub. So I was just hoping that either um, for me, I'd like to defer it. You know, we're having the short-term rentals. We're having the one that we just, 059, that we just heard um, coming forward. I think it would be, and I mentioned this to Council Fleetwood Corn, that it would be nice for us to carry them all together so that the advocates and whoever's following these bills can kind of um, um, move, um, listen to them simultaneously because they're all going to be coming back for the various different meetings. So I think it would be more seamless, but um, if it's not the will of um, Councillor Bibblecorn to defer, then I would just make a recommend, I would make a motion for um, no, uh, no rec to full council. Council Bibblecorn. Oh, um, Chair I Sanchez, just, I, I'm fine with the deferral. I just um, would like to make a few closing comments if there's a second to the to that deferral um, move. I'll second it. Defer till when? Mr. Chair, well, actually, I think she says on the one prior to this April, April the 10th, so we can do. Oh, that's right. It was April 10th. So defer April 10th. Mr. Chair, that seems like a long time to defer a bill that we have um, been working on for a very long time and, and lots of folks are ready for it to move. Um, I, I, of course, will defer to the will of the committee, but um, I would not be supporting that long of a deferral. Okay. So I was making it based on that seamless asking that there it'd be seamless moving forward. So if not, I mean, I would I would support, as I mentioned earlier, a, a motion for no rep to full council. So, but I think what we have on the floor is the deferral. Um, right, that's what I, we have the deferral on the floor right now. 
Um, and I did make a second for the deferral. Um, we can go to a vote on the deferral. And I, let me make a comment real quick. Um, one of the things that I really um, was, I was really impressed, Councilor and I, Councilor Feeblecorn and I really worked really, really hard in reference to to the bill. Um, there was certain things that, that we added and deleted um, to make this bill in what I feel is reasonable. Um, but when we heard some of the speakers, there's a couple of things that I think that we need to talk about in reference to the bill. So, um, and then also keeping it in line with the other bill makes sense. So um, that's why I went ahead and seconded the, the deferral. And um, if we're ready for a vote, um, deferral. So this deferral will be till April 10th of 2023. Councilor Basson. No. Councilor Davis. No, with an option to explain my vote after. Councilor Fibicorn. No. Councilor Pena. Yes. Councilor Sanchez. Yes. That fails on a 2-3 vote. So, Mr. Chairman, I'd like to make a motion um, after Councilor Davis makes his comment. No, Councilor <laughs> Davis. Never mind. It's okay. We'll we'll follow your motion, ma'am. Go ahead. Okay. So I'd just like to make a, a motion for no rec to full council. Okay. So motion, no rec to full council. Second. Do I get a second. Councilor Feeblecorn. Miss and Mr. Chairman, I make my a closing statement real quick. Yes. Go ahead, okay. Councilor Feeblecorn. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I you know. I, I want to thank everybody that participated in this public process. I think we have all agreed. I haven't heard any disagreement that um, people in, in Albuquerque are really challenged to be able to pay the excessive fees that are being charged by some landlords. And I was really heartened to see the number of people that came to these meetings, the number of landlords that came property managers, property owners that all said, wow, those kind of fees are are out there. They're not right. And they're not doing this. So we're talking about a few bad actors here, certainly not all uh, property managers and property owners in Albuquerque. And I think that what you see tonight was that you saw folks that participated throughout the entire process with me and getting this amendment, uh, the committee sub ready for tonight. And those that participated fully came here tonight to say this is a good bill. Those that came in with the bat with the um, with the false idea that this bill was bad and they were not willing to have any con conversations to improve it are still opposing. But those that participated and offered feedback, I don't think anyone that participated and offered feedback um, still have any concerns around this bill. So I think it's time to move forward. I think that it's time to get some fee. Um, um, assistance to people in Albuquerque who are hurting, who are on the edge of homelessness. Um, and so with that, I urge your support to get this to full council so that we can get the needed assistance to Albuquerque residents as soon as possible. Thank you, Councilor Pena. You're good. Any other councilors comment? Okay, so we're on recommendation to full council and need a vote. So just to clarify, it was no recommendation to full council. Councilor Basson. Yes. Councilor Davis. Yes. Councilor Fabelcorn. Yes. Councilor Pena. Yes. Councilor Sanchez. Yes. And that passes on a 5-0 vote. Okay, we now move on to agenda item F, which is 065, Councilor Bassan by request. Mr. Chair, 065 is amending Chapter 5 of the revised ordinances of Albuquerque, public purchases relating to council approval requirement of procurement thresholds of the code. I move it to pass. Second. 
and second by Councillor Feeblecorn. Is there Chair, this was my request, so I'd invite the administration to go ahead and explain and add in and sell us on it. Okay, let's hear the mayor's conference room. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I think I'll just start the discussion, uh, but we have some experts in the room. I have uh, Director of Finance, Stephanie Yara here, and also our procurement officer, Jennifer Bradley. Uh, so they would dive into the detail, but overall objective of this bill is to make the procurement process more efficient. Uh, in past, council uh, had increased the limits, limit uh, uh, during this administration, it, it has worked out well, but I think due to inflation, I think we, we probably want to reconsider the limits. Uh, we are requesting to increase the limits. I will start with uh, Ms. Yara and then uh, Ms. Bradley. Go ahead, Ms. Bradley. Yes, thank you, Mr. Mm -hmm. Chair and Councillors. Um, the first thing this uh, ordinance amendment would do is to remove the requirement that um, contracts that are one awarded under a competitive bid or RFP process be sent to council for final approval. Um, instead of sending those ECs at one, uh, piecemeal through the committee and up to council, we would instead send a quarterly report of all the recommendations of award that were made um, during the preceding quarter uh, for, for inspection and question by the councilors. The second change really that it's making is bumping up all of our thresholds for competitive bid and other contracts to $150,000. Currently, that limit is 100,000. It would also, um, and just to note that the federal procurement limit is $250,000 for reference. Um, it would also um, require that well, it would also actually bring in line all of the other limits. Uh, for example, the concession contracts are currently at 75,000. This would take it up to the standard 150, as well as the sole source procurement notification um, to council and to the public would be bumped up to 150 as well as some other, um, just really aligning all of the limits to the 150 mark. And um, Ms. Bradley is here for any more detailed questions. Um, she helped me, uh, she actually prepared this, this amendment for us. So. Thank you, Ms. Yara. And I have, see Councillor Davis's hands up. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. The committee might remember that at our last meeting, I had asked for a deferral till this meeting so we could have a chance to get some more information from the administration. And I could be mistaken, but I was just looking through my emails and uh, I know Mr. Bakhtin and I had a brief conversation uh, a few weeks ago about some of this, but I really haven't gotten any more information. But here's my concern, um, just to be blunt, and I, I don't think there's any purpose in beating a dead horse here, but um, I, there may be some pieces of this, and I think there are when it comes to procurement code cleanups that are important. Um, but as long as it's attached to the threshold changes, I can't support this amendment, and here's why. Um, as, as Mr. Bakhtin and Ms. Yara mentioned, talking about reconsidering our limits, I think the concern is that council did raise the limits to $100,000 um, and not too many years ago, uh, fairly in recent memory, um, but it's been those contracts in that new range, um, particularly around the extra money that went to the, the questionable um, or to the capital outlay around the turf that required some city matching funds that didn't come to this council, um, the book of the mayor's grand glory in, in COVID um, that did not come to this council. Um, and I haven't, still haven't seen how the administration, um, in other words, it's been those, those are contracts that have bumped up against that limit that have raised the most concerns. Um, additionally, I don't have a disagreement in principle with the idea that some of these awards through competitive process uh, probably can just be awarded and noticed which I think is makes it easy because I don't. I think once in my entire eight years we paused one of those for for reconsideration, or maybe twice. I think one of the airport contracts we changed or picked a different vendor off the list. Um, but again, I, I don't have an issue with that. It's just that 
the reports that we've asked from the finance department don't come to us on time. We made a compromise a year ago um, with uh, the, that part of the city government to provide us with the personnel to operating uh, transfers report. Those don't come on a quarterly basis. They don't have the detail we need. Uh, Ms. Yara and I, defer, we deferred that bill and Ms. Yara and I worked with APD, for example, over two meetings um, to get the data we needed. And it still took APD two meetings after a whole quarter late to get us that information. Um, I, I just don't see yet that the administration is ready to take on uh, less oversight with some of these items. And so, Mr. Chair, I would be prepared to do a, to modify the motion to a, a do not pass. Um, and so I'd like to reserve that option at the end if other counselors want to go. But at the at this point, if if there are important things in the purchasing order to clean up that need to be done, I would request the administration pull those out um, and separate them from this threshold piece until we can address some of these concerns. And I think the budget process is probably the right place to do that. Um, so, Mr. Chair, I would not be able to support this bill in committee as written. Thank you, Councillor Davis. Any other counselors? Oh, Mayor's Conference Room has their hand up. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, uh, Councillor uh, Davis, I appreciate your comment. I think we could do much better uh, as far as the reporting to you. I have promised you that, and I will continue to be better. Uh, with the help of the finance department that said, I think there is a lot of confusion when it comes to different kind of contracts. Right now, we have the professional and technical agreements, which has a limit of uh, $100,000 before it goes to the council. Sole source has $75,000 and concession contracts are also at $75,000. That kind of confuses sometimes even me. Uh, and I would urge council support to at least make that limit uh, 100,000. Overall, I believe $150,000 limit is more appropriate for the city of our size and the number of transactions that flow through procurement process and also the federal government limit. I, I, I still believe that 150,000 is, is what we need. However, uh, at minimum, uh, if we can have the same amount for those three kinds of contract, that would help us and it would minimize some uh, some extra time that it, it needs uh, before before we can start procuring those uh, items. And, and, and it would be easier on the vendor. And actually I, I have uh, uh, Ms. Bradley here who also would like to say our past experience uh, as far as this limits and how, how helpful it was to make the whole process more efficient and there is certainly more need to make it more efficient as I'm sure you all would agree. But Ms. Bradley, mm -hmm. if there is anything, you know, you would like to add. I think with, uh, as far as the end users and the city and the vendors, um, when we're talking about uh, transparency and the ease of using the procurement process, it makes it easier when the thresholds are the same. And Mr. Bakta, can I add something? Absolutely, yes. <laughs> and Mr. President and counselors, I just want to remind you that this is a central procurement code. It doesn't um, um, actually cover capital expenditures that, that goes through a different um, process. So to the extent we haven't notified you of larger capital expenditures, it's because it, it, has, it follows a different rule, so. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Councilor Davis. Thank you, Councilor Bassan. Mr. Chair, given the discussion and the, the feeling about it, I'd like to at least change the motion to a do not do not recommend without recommendation. That's without recommendations. <laughs> okay, say that again one more time. You'd like to make the change. I would like to change my motion to motion without rec. To a full council. And do we have a second? I don't know uh, who did the second from before. Penny. So now we're going to vote on, we're going to be voting on the um, do not rec, right? Mr. Chair, I think we have to take the other counselor's comments, but I think just okay, the motion there will be changed by the motion maker. Okay. And now I see Councillor Pena as her hand up as well. 
Thank you, Mr. Chair. I think with the motion for a do not wreck, I think I'm, I don't really have too many comments other than I agree with some of the statements that were being made. I was going to say the capital expenditures don't necessarily fall under this. And then also, I think it's really, you know, um, the city of, of, of our size and, and knowing that, you know, there are some small social service contracts that gives us the ability to be flexible in some of the things that we do. Um, I was just having a conversation earlier about how, you know, the RFP process for large grants that we have, you know, and these are large nonprofits who come in and have the capacity and ability to apply for some substantial grants that the city gives out. But then oftentimes we have smaller nonprofits that are, um, you know, doing really innovative things and it really gives the flexibility to be able to um, to to contract with them so that the city has opportunities to to actually look at maybe different methods before they go into the whole RFP process. I know if you look at the amount of um, um, for seventy five thousand dollars, even one hundred thousand dollars, that really doesn't pay for even you know one position. So I think you know if I was the mayor, I would really want that flexibility to be able to be a little. Um, um, pliable, I guess, and be able to make some some different um, choices. And I think it really gives an opportunity um, even for counselors to be able to um, look at smaller organizations who are being, you know, really innovative. Um, I think that really helps us out. And then plus, of course, we're doing studies and some of the studies that um, I know that I've asked for in the past, uh, studies are very expensive anymore. So again, um, hence, uh, I think that um, a, a consistent amount would be something that I would be supportive of. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Councilor Pena. And I see Councilor Davis's hand up again. Yes, Mr. Chair, just to respond to the new motion on the floor and, and to respond to the administration, I, I want to be clear. I don't, nothing personal about the administration or any of the folks involved. Uh, I've really appreciated the chance to speak with Mr. Bakta recently. Um, and I do understand, I think it makes sense to align these things to make it easier to understand and to facilitate. Um, I just think we have some, um, I think we have some gaps that need to be filled and systems that need to be in place better um, before we increase those other limits to this higher number. Um, and so I just don't think we're ready to do that at this time. Uh, that said, the motion on the floor is for a no rec, which would send this to the full council. I I, I guess I'm, I'm only one vote, but, um, and I'm not an old timer, but I'm not sure the administration would want to have this conversation at the full council as the bill stands with all those concerns that have been addressed or been raised without the opportunity to address them with the counselors. So I would vote no on the no rec um, on the intent of either a deferral to have a conversation with the administration uh, on some of these issues, um, or if that fails, I would make a motion for a do not pass. Um, but the motion is for a no rec, and so I can't support that at this time. I think we need either more time on this bill or to start over. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, uh, Councillor Davis. Councillor Basan. Uh, Mr. Chair, I'm going to, I mean, I know I'm the sponsor of the bill, but it is per request, so I'm going to defer to, um, I would like to ask, you know, how does the, the mayor's conference room feel about this? Because if the risk is you know, letting it either die here or laying all the cards out before the full council, I'll defer to what your preference is. I will say Councilor Pena threw in that study thing. So if this is gonna allow for more studies to happen, <laughs> I might not be as supportive, but um, all joking aside, uh, I, I do wanna ask, I mean, do, I'm, I'm willing to change my motion to a deferral. I'm willing to change, keep my motion at a do not rec. Those are the two that I'm willing to do. So, uh, Mr. Botka, what would you prefer? Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair and Councillor Bassan. I appreciate that uh, comment from Councillor Davis that uh, you, it seems that you are okay with uh, the, the contract not going to uh, the council for approval, but just a, a reporting mechanism, which which uh, would require the city procurement officer to provide, uh, you know, periodic report. I think it's a quarterly reports, and I, I, I'm I'm gauging that at least there is a support for that portion of the bill, and I appreciate that very much. I think that is our main concern, and we would like to move forward with that. As far as the increase increasing the limit, I'm I'm gauging that. Uh, you know, the council uh, is not ready to move the limit quite $250,000, I understand. 
but I also understand that you are okay to, to making that limit uniform and make it hundred thousand dollars for all three different kind of contracts and if there is a room to make an amendment here to change that language from 150 to 100 across the board for all three different kind of contracts we will be fine with that and as far as the reporting requirement i think i'm understanding that's okay with uh, uh, this committee and i would urge your support on making that amendment and then uh, making recommendation with that amendment to the full council. <clears throat> thank you. Mr. Chair, Mr. Sorry. Chair, I don't, I thank you. I don't know how the committee will feel about it, but I'm willing to say um, to make a, as the sponsor per request of the bill, I'm willing to um, move amendment number one, uh, changing everything that says $150,000 in this bill to $100,000. Good. and see what the will of the committee is. I need a second. I'll second. And we'll go to a vote. Councilor, the amendment. Councilor Bassan. Yes. Councilor Davis. No. Councilor Fiebelkorn. No. Councillor Pena. No. Councillor Sanchez. Yes. That fails on a 2 3 vote. Okay. Let's, Mr. Chair. So, Councillor Davis, go ahead. Uh, again, going back to the sponsor by request, but I, if this is not something that needs to get done this week, um, I might suggest that a deferral might be useful to keep this here. I agree with Mr. Bakta. There are probably some places I think there's some easy agreement and perhaps some amendments that could be created, um, but maybe not on the fly uh, to address some of those concerns. Um, I, I think Mr. Bakta is correct. I think there are some reporting things that are good, provided that um, I would be willing to sponsor, for example, uh, if there were some timelines on that reporting so that quarterly reports are provided more timely than some have been. Some are great and some are not. So um, I just think we could work on those compromise areas if the administration was willing to defer and if the sponsor by request was willing to defer. Um, I would give this my full time and attention uh, with the administration if they were so willing. Otherwise, um, I would uh, I would vote no and I guess we'll see it at council. Councilor Bassan. Mr. Chair, I'd like to hear from the mayor's conference room, please. Okay, Mayor's Conference Room, we'd like to hear from you. Thank you, Mr. Chair and uh, Councillor Bassan. Uh, I appreciate the opportunity to uh, provide the input. I think in lieu of uh, recommending this, uh, we would prefer that you defer this and uh, we will reach out to all of you individually and discuss any concerns you might have and then maybe uh, work on a final bill. Appreciate that. Thank you. And Mr. Chair, I would like to change my motion to um, a deferral to uh, the next 30 days. Please. So that, well, whatever FBO meeting that is. To, to okay, that's good. okay, March 13. So we'll look at a deferral to March 13. I got a second by Councillor Davis, and mm -hmm. we'll go for a vote on the deferral. Councillor Bassan. Yes. Councillor Davis? Yes, and thanks to the administration. Councillor Fribilcorn? Yes. Councillor Pena? Yes. Councillor Sanchez? Yes. That passes on a 5 0 vote. Okay, we will now move to agenda item G, R93. And it looks like Councillor Sanchez for Benton. R93 approving and authorizing <clears throat> the filing of a grant application for rapid rapid transit operating costs with the Federal Transit Administration FTA of the US Department of Transportation and providing for an appropriation to the transit department. Move a due pass. Councilors, any questions? Oh, need a second. Second by Councilor Davis. And Councilor, any questions? Uh, or any questions for the staff and administration? Mr. Chair, not to prolong this, but 
and um, it's my fault we're here because we deferred this last time waiting for some answers or just to be sure we had our grant process in order to ensure this wasn't going to happen again in the transit department. Uh, this is one of those things and I appreciate Mr. Bakta and his team uh, for looking at acknowledging some gaps and, uh, and, and helping to fix them. So I'm more confident now that this won't happen and I appreciate it. I know this is urgent. And so um, if we do this today, I would hope or ask the administration or the, our staff if we need immediate action since we deferred this at my request at our last meeting. So thank you, Mr. Chair. I would support the motion. Thank you, Councillor Davis. Any other councillors? Mayor's conference room? No? Mr. Chair, oh. I had a question. Oh, sorry about that, Councillor Fiebelkorn. That's okay. Thank you. Um, I, you know, I... Remember when this was deferred, was sent to council, we had this conversation. I have not received any information. So I'm wondering if somebody could perhaps provide some information on why this was delayed to council so long and what steps have been taken to make sure that things are not delayed this long to council in the future. Hmm. Okay, we're ready for mayor's conference room to chime in on that. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I have a transit director Keener here as well as uh, uh, DFAS Director Yara and I would uh, I would defer to them to respond uh, what act what procedures that we have uh, put in place to prevent such uh, situation in the future. Yes, uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Councilor Fiebelkorn. Um, so again, we were here just because of an oversight and a resolution back in twenty one um, that did contain several CMAC grants that were both operating capital that were related to the central. Um, and it was just an oversight that this art operating grant was left off inadvertently. Um, when it was discovered, they, we have put in some processes in place to help us track and reconcile these grants. Um, so we are confident that going forward that we will have much more timely um, applications um, to come to council for, for making the application for these grants. And um, also in regards to um, Councillor Davis, yes, we would like to request immediate action on this one uh, moving forward with it as well. And Mr. Chair, I just want to add a for DFAS's part. Um, I do have a grant administrator. I've asked her to um, just kind of get the recurring grants that we have and set some ticklers and reminders for departments. Um, so we can probably not have them operating in a silo up there. Thank you. Real quickly, thank you, Ms. Yada. I think that's really important because we need to make sure that um, this doesn't happen again. My question was going to be, why didn't you have some sort of tracking in place prior to? So now I've just heard you say that you're going to start making sure that these grants are are tracked so that they're not missed in the future. So I appreciate that. And I also have Councillor Davis's hand up. Well, and, and Mr. Chair, not to prolong the meeting, which I've already done today, um, but uh, Ms. Yara, maybe you could help me. And this is a good question, actually. Um, do we not, or do we now have, or how do we manage, you know, we've got some departments that manage their own fiscal process, some departments use uh, DFA and your, your folks. How does the department keep up with uh, when grant say, you know, tranches are due or reports are due? Is that down to the individual department level? And I'm thinking in particular about in years past, not recently, um, although maybe there's another one, but um, family and community services have struggled on some grants in the past to do the mandatory reporting in a timely manner. Like who in the city is responsible for keeping up with all of those deadlines and reports and things, or is that down on a department level? So, so Mr. Chair and Councillor Davis, um, <clears throat> the it, it actually really depends on the capacity of the user department. So Unfortunately, you mentioned family. They're actually one of the ones who have a more robust um, staffing for grant coordination and tracking. Um, uh, Marianne Kemp is my grant administrator and she kind of tries to have an entrance conference for all grants that are coming our way so that she can help determine whether she needs to help the department with the back end reporting um, or are we just setting up the grants in the PeopleSoft system? Or are we doing the full-blown compliance reporting for them? Um, um, as you know, our, our grant unit is kind of relatively new to the city. It's been in existence maybe eight years, eight, 10 years. Um, and I'm, I'm 
personally, my opinion is that we need more staff in those units, but um, you know, it's hard to in this day and age to find uh, the right um, staffing complement, especially in grants. Um, one of the things on the front end is we suffer from not having enough grant writers, of course, and that flows through through the whole the whole cycle of the grant um, through compliance and program reporting. So, um, unfortunately, I don't have a good answer for you. It really just depends on the grant, how complex it is, and what capacity each dealer department has. Thank you, Ms. Jara. Mr. Chair, I just might ask, and then I know other counselors, so I won't continue, but Ms. Jara, if you know, or if they could tell us, is there a module in PeopleSoft we can turn on to help track some of this stuff? Like, the, we can't be the only ones trying to figure this out. Um, Mr. Chair and Counselor Davis, um, we do use the project costing module to do grants. It's the same module that CIP uses for their projects. Um, and and I'm, I'm actually not as familiar with how it's been um, configured and whether there's improvements that could be made. Um, the grants module, of course, um, connects highly with our accounts receivable module, which is now working pretty well. Um, so just some process improvements we need to look at. Thank you. Um, Councillor Pena. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. I'm in total agreement with Councillor Davis. You know, this is something that um, had been proposed a few budgets back when I was committee of the whole chair. I really wanted to create a citywide grants management department with all the facets of grants management. I know that uh, at the time, it just wasn't something that, um, um, you know, people were wanting to take on. So I know that we've hired some people there at council. And then, of course, the mayor's hired some folks. But I really think it's important because, um, you know, we're hearing from our federal lobbyists um, year after year that the city of Albuquerque were leaving so many, so much money on the table. And if we could really organize and coordinate our, our grants um, application and process, I think we could be more successful in, in getting more money here to the city of Albuquerque. So I'm budget time. So maybe Council Rasan and I can talk to her about um, kind of what that looked like and if there's a appetite for that I'm going to do it. So. Councillors, anyone else? And Councillor Davis, you've mentioned something about immediate action. Um, could you clarify that, please? Yes, sir, Mr. Chair. If this matter, if this item uh, passes the committee uh, tonight, I would also ask for an immediate action vote after that so that we could hear it at our next council meeting uh, and not delay the receipt of the funds or whatever we have to do at this point. Okay. I was also informed by the clerk that, um, clerk, that if uh, it does, we would need a full uh, five votes in order to move it to immediate action. Okay. So we're back on the vote. Councilor Bassan? Yes. Councilor Davis? Yes. Councilor Fiebelkorn? Yes. Councilor Pena? Yes. Councilor Sanchez? Yes. That passes on a 5 0 vote. Mr. Chair, I'd like to make a motion for immediate action. So now, Councilor Davis for immediate action vote, and second by Councilor Fiebelkorn. And ready for the vote. Councilor Bassan? Yes. Councillor Davis? Yes. Councillor Fiebelkorn? Yes. Councillor Pena? Yes. I didn't hear you, Councillor Pena. We didn't hear you. I'm sorry. Yes. Thank you. you. Councillor Sanchez? Yes. That passes on a 5 0 vote. I think you're muted, Mr. Chair. I got muted by uh, someone else. Councilors, there being no further business, this FGO committee meeting is adjourned. Thank you. <laughs>